Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can head over to patreon.com slash toahado. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash t-w-a-h-i-d-o. You can also join the YouTube channel directly at either a dollar a month or five dollars a month. Today, our special guest is Lika Diakon Tasfa Mikael, also known as Rowan Williams. Welcome to the program, brother. Thank you, Deacon uh, Hinog. Yeah, yeah, glad to be with you today. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of the uh, the podcast, so uh, yeah, very happy to be with you today. Thank you so much. But I'm a namasa ganalen, and I I thought we would start on a kind of biographical note. I w- I would think that a number of my audience knows who you are because you've been at this for quite a while. Um, I'm sure longer than me. Um, and and I've been at it for a while now too. So, um, but there are certainly going to be people who don't know. So you'll forgive me if if I have you repeating things that you've said on on other programs you've been on. But um, we'll we'll try to have our unique aspects as as well. How how did you come to be a deacon in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church? How did how did you find this gem? Because I I want to imagine or uh, that that you weren't born uh, in the church. Of course, you were born again in the church. Yes, yeah, that's right. Um, I was born again in the church. Thanks be to God. Amen. Um, so yeah, my um, my story in in brief. I mean, um, you can you can hurry me along if uh, you know uh, I, I get into some um, side points and it's not so interesting. But um, you know, I was raised um, in a an agnostic family. I mean. Um, I'd say, you know, my parents were um, agnostic um, Anglicans, you know, so um, church was really just a kind of um, cultural um, thing that they did rather than an expression of um, faith or belief and a thing along those lines. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're talking about going to, to church, um, you know, Christmas once a year, that's, that's really it. And then, you know, we had religious assembly, but very much, yeah, Church of England um, as the culture was uh, more predominantly, uh, you know, um, uh, at that time during the 1980s. So I grew up in that environment, you know, there was no mention of God or uh, that kind of thing, uh, scripture or related matters at home uh, growing up. Um, it was really when I, um, you know, got to, to secondary school or, you know, high school um, for the uh, American audience that um, I, I began to, you know, uh, delve a little deeper, you know, we have a uh, religious education. So sort of, um, learning about, um, other faiths as well, you know, religious education is generally a, a multi-faith kind of, um, subject that we take at secondary school. Um, and, um, you know, I got, um, very interested in, in the Rastafari movement, um, at, uh, that age. And also the, uh, the, the, um, community or the, um, people that um, I was socializing with at that time also um, really uh, kind of inspired me to um, to follow in that uh, in that track and um, yeah it was it was uh, due to that that um, you know I um, I got into the, the Rastafari movement and not just um, any kind of Rastafari but a specific uh, house or mansion within the Rastafari movement, which is uh, known as the Bobo Shanti House. Um, um, so yeah, kind of. Um, I, I, I'm familiar with that one. That one um, is a little bit more priestly than some of the others, right? Because uh, some of the, some of the people kind of uh, who assess the movement think of it as one blob, or you know, some people might think of Christianity in that way too, if they don't know the the particulars. But right. yeah, could could you say a little bit about how this house is is different? Because I've I've met people from Bobo Shanti as well as from the twelve tribes, and I've noticed differences just between those two. And I'm sure there are plenty of houses that even I don't know about. Yeah, well, I mean the the three houses are the um, the main ones, you know. So Bobo Shanti, uh, Nyabingi, and twelve tribes of Israel. Um, the Ethiopian World Federation is not really a house because, you know, it's, it's really a kind of, um, I would say, black uh, nationalist um, organization. So you can be, you know, Seventh-day Adventist and be a, you know, a member of the World, Tri- World, uh, World Ethiopian World Federation, rather. 
but yeah, to get back to your question about the, the Bubba Shanti House, yes, uh, it's more priestly. So the um, initiated members are called prophets and priests, right? Uh, the leader um, is or was uh, uh, King Emmanuel and um, King Emmanuel Charles Edwards. Um, you know, the, the Bubba Shanti would say, you know, uh, nobody knows who his parents were, but, you know, he... Uh, he uh, arrived on the scene, let's say the Nyabingi scene in the um, early part of the 20th century and uh, led a you know, significant uh, movement and it was in the Rastafara movement itself. So, um, you know, he led um, a group of um, Bobo to, um, you know, establish their own camp, firstly around uh, Kingston and uh, later on, you know, not too far, about 10 miles away from, from Kingston in uh, what's known as uh, Bull Bay. So it's a kind of monastic, in a sense, mon monastic kind of uh, settlement in the hills. And it's, you know, the continually service, you know, night and day throughout the uh, the day, uh, reading Psalms and then chanting through the night certain times of the year. Uh, so it's very liturgical um, in its expression. And, you know, they're, they're, they're also known for being quite, um, uh extreme in some senses you know so it's a black supremacy uh movement so um black supremacy in, in righteousness of salvation is um is one of the uh mantras if you like one of the um um points that they really emphasize so you could say that you know went from um black supremacy to orthodox christianity but uh you know that's the, the bobushanti um order in 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 a nutshell is is yes it's kind of um remove from society so they really don't want to be mixed up or polluted by babylon although you know uh many of the members travel into um the city every week you know uh especially to sell brooms they're known for selling brooms and you know their self-reliance they they make the brooms there the um the camp and and they go out to sell them so it's it's very much you know self-reliance and then as i say the liturgical cycle um of the uh, the day and the week um as well the sabbath is also very important and repatriation is 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 really one of the um points that they they highlight so um to know, shashamani uh, well shashamani um yes <laughs> but um yeah I, I just know that the the king had given a plot of land to um i i guess anyone who had wanted to repatriate at that at the time right that's right yeah uh, but this also yeah goes back to um the point that i made that with them being viewed as a little more extreme in that they don't um like sort of mixing with uh the other groups to some extent you know they have their own um doctrine and so forth and you know they like to keep that pure as it were and um, Re reminiscent of the the dead sea scrolls community the quran community the uh, yes. the essenes where they would be categorized as jews at the time but you know they set themselves kind of apart with their own prayer protocol and, and everything else yes yeah no, that's an interesting comparison um so yeah i mean uh, the focus was always um Addis, but um, uh, and also there was a, a mission sent to Nigeria and the Ghana, um, you know, in, in the time of uh, King Emmanuel. I think uh, in, you're talking in the, the early 70s. Um, so, um, yeah, the um, the, the Bobo Shanti movement, Bobo Shanti order is, is uh, kind of known for that, you know, uh, slightly being slightly exclusive. Um, and um, uh, Shashimani was something that came into into the picture because of necessity you know because uh they weren't able to really maintain my understanding the the life in in addis uh, during the time of the derga and so forth so they were kind of compelled to you know turn to their brothers and sisters who were living in shashimani i.e the uh you know uh the um rasta of the uh, nayabingi and the, the 12 tribes of israel and you know uh non uh uh, conformist shall we say or the the, the raster who don't um, belong to any particular house so yeah it's uh, fascinating you you know you didn't have just some sort of cursory knowledge of this and now i'm i'm curious about the the type of educational setting because you know one of my other interests um 
to an extent, I think we have a few grade schools in Ethiopia, and you might know this better than I do. I've heard of Miskaya Zunan as well as Kudus in the capital city, Addis Ababa, having grade schools attached to it. But I, I have a dream where each diocese, if not every parish, would have you know some sort of micro school where we're educating our children. Um, in the United States, it's very common for various Protestant denominations, but most famously the Roman Catholic Church, to to be having these institutes. And and frankly, even in Ethiopia, I know many people who are are believers who grew up in Adventist churches or in um, R- Roman Catholic churches or even Pentecostal because they had these grade schools attached. But it's it has me curious now. You said it was an agnostic Anglican household. I know the Anglican church has, um, I don't know if it was the case in the 80s, this low church and high church services, low church being kind of more evangelical, sometimes maybe even like a charismatic church, whereas high church would be very approximate to orthodox if if the dogmatics you know, itself would would be off. I'm wondering if uh, which of those settings it was, and then were they were they teaching, for example, Rastafarianism as one of the religions? If so, I would be very surprised and intrigued by by that uh, educational model. Um, yes. So uh, the first question, um, it was uh, certainly low church. What would be, what would uh, be yeah, uh, deemed low church? However, you're not talking about you know. Um, just um, you know, some people coming together in a in a uh, a town hall or a church, you know, in a hall or something you know, like uh, many evangelicals would, you know, they have no kind of um, uh, particular uh, veneration of the building. You know, it, it's, it's very much you know, uh, lots of um, say images. They're not really icons, but you know, stained glass, the saints, and you know, that's that's all very much. Um, part of it you know the the ancient buildings go back um you know hundreds of years and um although it's not really high church um you know uh the, the kind of churches that i went to as a child um you know it's still not uh, kind of low evangelical uh almost non-denominational you know in in a in a sense so um yeah that was uh, that was uh the uh, your first question sorry your second one about the, the, the rastafari the- movement it's yeah, cool. because I'm wondering if you learned about the movement through this sort of, uh, you said, this kind of universalist religion um, that they were teaching, uh, or, or was it kind of your independent inquiry? Well, I'd say both. Um, yeah, it was kind of uh, just the um, the situation in which I found myself. So, the, the you know, um, the social network in which I found myself led me to, as I say, um, be inspired to pursue it um, at a, a higher level. So, you know, I was very much interested in, in reading more about it. And, you know, you could go to the library and get books uh, at that time. Um, and yes, uh, it was uh, it was actually included in uh, some of the material uh, at, at oh. high school, secondary school. Um, so, um, you know, yeah, there was some kind of uh, rudimentary uh, information that I was provided with at school. Um, and um, yeah, uh, I'd say when you say the kind of universalist religion, I mean, obviously, um, you know, uh, they're not, uh, the, the, the schools here are not looking to indoctrinate people. It's a no, kind of secular no, no. school system. Yeah. Um, although, you know, I did go to, to one um, Christian school, um, Protestant, you know, uh, Church of England school. Um, but yeah, they're, they're not obviously trying to uh, indoctrinate anybody there. They're trying to give you a kind of objective view of, um, you know, the, the, the world religions. Um, mm-hmm. Although the subject itself, religious education, came out of um, uh the uh, the government and the church wanting a christian nation after the war it was established in the 40s okay and then it was only by the 60s that questions started to be asked about other religions you know what about the others and you know there are lots of you know indians and uh <laughs> yeah. other nationalities in the country you know that, that it shouldn't be just you know us teaching them uh, about the bible and so on so um that's uh, yeah religious education um you know really made me want to uh, dig deeper in, in my reading, and um, that's what I did. And but also, you'd say the um, experiences, you know, uh, social experiences, um, the kind of networks that, that uh, you know I was uh, involved in, and so on, really gave me the um, the inspiration. You know, like the the kind of cultural 
um, scene during the nineties, you know, was uh, jungle jungle mu music. Yeah, before drum and bass was yeah jungle, um, and you know it's very much kind of uh, influenced by yeah what we call now bashment dancehall. Uh, would say you know raga yeah back in the in the you know in the 90s <laughs> yeah and it, it's that that has become itself um more popular i think over the past uh 10 years or so it in in the sense of i think it was more of a subculture before whereas you see some very mainstream environments now that are um, <laughs> maybe even some people feeling culturally appropriating it but you know that's some of the language that is in use when when something that is a subculture gets you know makes it into the into the mainstream consciousness yep. I, I i'm so fascinated by the way um I, I think you were worried about us going down rabbit holes or an aside i think this whole show the beauty of it is um you know i come in with some sort of big themes and motif thoughts but really i think the organic way in which you learned and got to the place that you are right now is the way I think education happens the best, and and so I'm I'm pursuing even the conversation in that way pedagogically, and um, the traditional school, the Abinet in Ethiopia. It's so fascinating having conversations with, for example, the administrator of my parish, who's a, a monk, a Kwamos, as well as our our bishop, who's also, of course, uh, a monk, and they told me that as young as ten years old and thirteen years old they left their their families and their home and at, at that point it's not as if the church imposes step one step two step three in terms of curriculum if, if you think about it, if you told it to an educator they would think you're insane but you're giving 10 year olds and 13 year olds 100 percent control over their curriculum now they're not making things up because they're in a in a relatively controlled environment. The environment is prepared for them. The various schools of learning, they have the kini, they have the kadasi, they have the mahalit, the various poetry and chanting schools. Um, but they really get to choose wherever they go. Sometimes they're with somebody for three months. Sometimes they're there for five years and they replace that person. And it's fascinating because without having grown up in that tradition, you emulated it somehow. And I think it's good for us to reflect on this because sometimes we have, you know, uh, pious parents like, uh, like you and I would be, right? And the children aren't able to replicate the piety. And sometimes I, I've seen this happen frequently in the United States. I don't know if it's the same in the UK. And, and so the question is, you know, do do you try to raise them secularishly so they rebel against you and become pious? Uh, because you grew up in a relatively secular home. I grew up in the, in the same environment. My my parents have never consistently gone to church in their life. And I would say, you know, they baptized me. They took me to the major high holidays of the church. But that was really more of like a, a cultural homage. And because uh, I still had grandparents and grand aunts alive that would probably eat them if they didn't do that. Uh, so... Uh, you know, they, they had, if not the fear of God, the fear of older uh, family members that compelled right. them to, to, to do that. But really, I, I was raised in an agnostic home as well. And so you and I have achieved this level uh, in a sense, uh, if you view it that way, I don't know. If you don't, you can tell me, rebelling against the agnosticism for this organized religion in the 21st century. And so one of the questions I wonder is, you know, if we want to foster people like us, you know, what, how do we approach, um, uh, that medium? I, I don't know if you've thought about it in, in, in raising your kids or in, um, in, in the community that you're working there at Sarhaz Eon. Okay. So, um, I think, um, yeah, it's important, you know, as you mentioned, um, within the Abnet setting for, um, children to have some degree of, um, uh understanding uh as to what their particular charisms their particular skills or the, the natural direction um that they to, to follow in life in terms of um education and also piety um i think that's really important you know and i, I think yeah it just naturally comes out when you're provided uh, with 
the right environment. So for myself, you know, raising my own girls, you know, uh, I think it's important to simply, you know, provide the environment um, and not to kind of compel um, anyone to do anything. You know, of course, God doesn't compel us, doesn't force us to believe, right? So, you know, um, taking the the, the, the uh, example of our Lord and, you know, um, really i would uh, i would say that yeah it's, Im it's important to at least open the door um and to let them experience uh, as much as possible and to educate them that to educate them uh as to what what is available and you know how they could pursue and really you know just listen to uh children and you know pursue the, the conversations to find out you know what it is the kind of questions that they're asking and really try to to dig deeper and um you know help them understand help them make their, their own decisions um so yeah that that would be my my take on um you know raising uh youth as a parent uh within the church uh so yeah i'm very much um very much uh yeah with I you think on that's that beautiful place. Yeah, that's a beautiful balance to to prepare the environment, like you said, and and you know it's our job to sow, <laughs> and how how the seed grows, we we leave that up up to God, but we do our our duty, and part of the the duty you felt in in this draw is to go and and learn yourself. So how how did you know where to go you know did someone instruct you how to learn or how to pursue studies in the church yeah no, that's a good question um when i was first baptized uh, so we missed the, the whole kind of uh, lead up to orthodoxy but when <laughs> after i was baptized um you know i i just wanted to to learn more you know to find out what's out there i could obviously see that there's not a great deal um in the english language in the um the books bookshops the bookstores in um addis ababa so um yeah i, I just kind of uh, branched out and tried to speak to as many uh, well informed um uh, people clergymen and um uh, scholars uh, as possible and um you know yeah one of the um uh first things that i heard was about the holy trinity theological college um so i just i just turned up i just went went down and you know see yeah to find somebody to speak to and um you know the uh Zabinya, he, he just pointed me to the uh <laughs> the office of uh former abba Haile mariam melissa uh so currently um abuna argawi his eminence abuna argawi um and um you know he was more than happy to, you know, welcome me into his office, and um, you know, I expressed, you know, I'm, I'm learning some Amharic as well as, you know, the, the doctrines of the church. And, oh yes, you know, come and sit down, and you know, we'll go through. I had the um, the book. I forget the title now. It's the the one with um, uh, order of worship, ecumenical relations. It's Amharic and English, front oh, and back. Uh, is it Fatan Agast? No, not for Tanagust. It's um, produced by the church. It was in the time of, um, I think, started under Abunemark Orios and finished under Abunep Aulos. Um, so, you know, yeah, it, you know, included uh, lots of the um, uh, scholars like uh, Magabi Guluy, uh, Seifa Selassie, uh, and, uh, you know, um, yeah, quite quite a lot of the scholars from the Bikaun uh, Kubai and so forth, uh, and it was translated into English. It was actually the World Council of Churches that requested uh, that document uh, be produced. So we went through that, you know, it starts with the existence of God and, you know, the, the five pillars of mystery and, you know, seven sacraments and all of this. And, you know, he took me through it. I actually had um, kind of a catechism whilst in Shashamani just because I was interested in reading the Bible in Amharic beforehand. Um, but yeah, as I say, it was after um, I was uh, baptized that I just started to go out, you know, into the world and start to ask the questions, you know, just, uh, you know, with, yeah, um, my my interest and, you know, uh, led by the Holy Spirit, I would say, you know, so um, uh, that was uh, that was one way. Um, but also it's more specifically, um, you know, uh, there's. Uh, priest here who's been uh, 
in in UK for uh, more than forty years now. Lika uh, Branat, Gebre Georgis. Um, you know, he came over here during the imperial uh, regime um, and remained here. And um, he advised me personally. Yeah, he said, you know, go for the degree at Holy Trinity Theological College and. Um, that's that's basically. I didn't look back from there. I just uh, you know uh, put all my my uh, energy into that, and you know uh, thanks be to God. You know He brought it to yeah, fruition, brought it to completion. I graduated in um, 2014. So yeah, from 2010 to 2014, um, I was there at the uh, theological college, and um, that's that's really how um, I managed to, to to go there with just you know speaking to. As many of the fathers and scholars as possible. That's wonderful. And and they conduct their courses there in English or in Amharic. Yeah, the medium of um, uh, education uh, communication is um, mostly in uh, English, actually, uh, officially. Mm -hmm. However, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Officially, <laughs> you know, you might have the, the handouts in English sometimes and, you know, nearly all the, the conversation is, you know, we, we read a page from the handouts and then discuss it all in Amharic. So, the, yeah, you know, uh, it might say that, the, you know, the church history is in English, right? But we, 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 read, we read, read the material and then we discuss it in Amharic. So, you know, I had to kind of, um, uh, you know, get with it uh, fairly quickly there with regards to the, the language and also because it's obviously designed for um, Ethiopians. Um, you know, most of the Amharic subjects are put at the front, you know, so like um, Hadiskidan, Bulikidan, mm -hmm. Ene, <laughs> all of these things are right at the beginning, you know, so so in a sense it was it kind of, I was dropped in the deep end. Yeah. Um, and uh, my grades uh, improved a bit more, you know, the further um, down the line I got um, with regard to the, you know, the uh, subjects that were actually in English. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, mostly English. I think they say it's around three quarters or two thirds is supposed to be in English and the rest in Amharic. That's right. Uh, and I've, I've heard other people who've learned the language. And it's hard for me to say because Amharic was my first language in the home. So it's it's hard for me to even you know judge the level of difficulty for example but a lot of our texts are in, in Giz as well and we've mentioned this the, it's the language of the church whereas Amharic is the vernacular did it, did learning Giz seem easier or not than Amharic or vice versa even when you mentioned reading the bible this desire to read the bible in Amharic I smiled because you know um, I think when my parents were like born uh, around that time is when the bible was first printed in Amharic. And even in those first few years, people in our church, you know, uh, wrongly a lot of time would be very skeptical of that translation. It, it came top down. It was, it was the emperor's decision to translate into Amharic. The church kind of on its own, although he was a figure of the church in a sense, um, hadn't come to that conclusion yet. There were the, the Tereguami Beit had the interpretations in Amharic, but oftentimes the the biblical text was preserved in in Giz, and and some people tell me that the grammar of Giz is kind of closer to English for them than Amharic, um, and just in terms of like the order of verbs and nouns and 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 such. Was did you find one easier or harder, or were you just you know able to just get through both of them? You you talk about how they threw you in the deep end. Well, thank God you, you didn't sink. You know, you've, you've been thriving <laughs> and we're going to get into some of your publications as well, which is what I would like to promote here and have people um, make sure they purchase them and and, and read and, and really live a, a life of prayer because you've dedicated yourself to filling in this gap that you saw. You know, it's not like you had some preconceived notion of what your ministry was going to look like, but you adapted. You say, hey, there aren't these things. We need these things. That's right. Yeah, you know, the, uh, your question about the the, the Bible is uh, really interesting. I mean, because we still haven't got um, one complete Bible in Giz, right? That you know, uh, we have eighty one books, uh, Samanya Wahadu uh, books. And last time I spoke to the Ligaun uh the Patriarchate, they told me that that was a project, you know, to mm -hmm. to complete the Bible. 
So, okay, we, we still I have the yeah. New Testament. They have printed the New Testament officially from the Synod, whereas before, I think it was some Catholic is right press in Asmara that, that they had a printing press because of the Italians over there. And I had seen that. They have the Samantu Behera Orid, um, which is the first eight books of the Bible plus Jubilees. Uh, right. that's what I've seen in print. I haven't seen anything else in print. And then you have to just buy everything else individually. Like, uh, I think if you, if you buy the, the Andamta books, you can find the text. But like you said, there's no one bound 81 book one. And people ask me all the time right. for an English version. And I try to explain to them that there's no good version, let alone an English <laughs> version, like commercially available. Right, yeah, and even uh, you mentioned the the New Testament in Giz, um, which you know, thank God, that's available, um, and you can find the PDF online, the Platt um, edition. Um, but um, still, we haven't got the the eight books of uh, Church Order, the uh, Clementine Octatuke. You mentioned the uh, the Octatuke of the Old Testament, the uh, you know um, uh, of uh, of the Prophet Moses, uh, the Octatuke of uh, Moses, but um, yeah, the Clementine Octatuke is also very important and you know that's uh, that's certainly not included in the the published uh, uh, edition of the uh, uh, new testament so um you know yeah i think we still have a way to go there but no to get back to your question which was uh, which uh, language uh, i found easier i found amharic a lot easier when i actually went through the giz um, courses at a seminary theological college so um I realized, okay, this is a structure and this is how you learn it. Okay, it makes sense because I just don't jump straight in with a dictionary and just speaking to people and, you know, uh, <laughs> then uh, kind of worked it out and, you know, what does C mean? Okay, uh, yeah, it's about time and Lee, okay, it's conditional and, you know, eventually you just kind of get the um, the grasp of it that way. But, you know, kind of looking at it um, uh, from the perspective of uh, the traditional education system, you know, the way that um, Giz uh, is taught, well, it's Kenny Bates. We had uh, Kenny on one side and Giz uh, on the other side. So it was, um, you know, uh, Giz Amharic translation in the, the last uh, semester. And before that, mostly um, uh, it was uh, grammar and so on. So, um, you know, um, yeah, Amharic was a lot easier after uh, I, I studied Giz, uh, because you know it, it gave me that kind of you know, um, straightforward uh, system of learning, which uh, which I hadn't had uh, the first time round. So I was very much I very much appreciated that. And then I tried to to replicate it with uh, Tigrinya, although you know uh, I think I might have um, sunk sunk when I was thrown in the deep end there. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Gize allo, gize allo zahwe. I'm I'm on that Tigrinya learning journey as as well. So uh, right. we we can we can struggle through that one together. <laughs> it's Amiya Samarle. Amen, amen. So you graduated and not that long ago relative to how how productive you've been in 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 producing works i know i'm supposed to be getting it later this week because of the pandemic it's been a it's been a while but a, a friend of mine uh purchased for me the the prayer book that you have of of the daily prayers can you tell us about that publication just in terms of what's in it and um you know for the sake of the audience i, I think some of the people may not know so please um let, let us know a lot about that publication right yeah so it's called uh, daily prayers of the ethiopian orthodox Twaido church um that's my title um the texts that are included in it are what are known as um Kaltimert. Kaltimert, which is the uh you know they're the prayers that you learn um, by rote, you know, you repeat these prayers over and over and um, you memorize them. Uh, so, Gal meaning sort of memorization in that sense, you know, of course, Gal means word, but yeah, in in, the, in that sense, you know, it's um, a kind of um, education by memorization. So, um, yeah, the, the prayers are the daily prayers, so you need to know these prayers for you know, most of the services, Buddhasi um, Mariam, you know, Melka Mariam, Melka Yesus, you know, these prayers are, are prayed all the time, so you need to, to remember them all. Um, however, um, I've produced it in English. 
And the reason why I produced it in English is because our Kasegebes, Kasegebes Haile Maskel Samuels, um, really persisted in um, um, pushing me to, to do it. He, he first um, approached me when I was in my dissertation year, uh, 2019. Um, and um, I said, no, I'm, I'm doing my dissertation, Father, you know, no chance I'm going to be, you know, <laughs> <laughs> producing a prayer book. And then I got a call back the next the next week, uh, no, we need the prayer book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he just pushed me and pushed me. And OK, I said, OK, yeah, this is it's obviously clearly something I need to do. So um, so I, I just did it. I mean, I had a, an old translation from, uh, I'd say, uh, maybe around 2013, 2014 um so i just um reproduced it and um you know made it accessible for our members especially here at Zerhation. um the the prayer book that we had you know was um just uh, with Asi Mariam no uh, you went um you know just the the opening prayers um and uh, um yeah um that that was all we had really um so I wanted to bring it into the 21st century, you know, the, the text that we had, because, uh, you know, Wallace Budge's translation of uh, Wadassi Mariam is uh, Elizabethan English, was in the Elizabethan <laughs> English, the D and Dao, and, you know, yeah, um, all of that. So, um, and these were conversations that um, I'd had with the clergy before I left for seminary, um, you know, that uh, we need to update the language gradually and, you know, uh, move forward in that that way so um yep i uh, i just did a fresh translation of the uh, all the texts of uh, what we call Galtimert. um and uh, so there are six parts is uh, what's called common prayer zelozweter um wedasi mariam the veneration of our lady mary um some prefer praises praises more um universal i suppose in the in the catalogues and so on you'll find praises of mary yep um but I prefer veneration praise cannot generally um i've seen dictionaries that uh say praise can be um for the saints generally um you know you find praise for um in this in the sense of worship praise in the sense of worship so veneration uh of mary um or dasi mariam and get the gate of light you were disarmed the angels venerated her um melka mariam melka jesus so the milk of mary the milk of jesus so um the the milk uh, genre is um you know i'm sure you've mentioned it on your program before i think somebody um i mentioned it to me that you you've been discussing you know the the, the meaning of milk as image um and also it's a hard a, word to translate it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a very hard word to translate in that context yeah yeah so i take it in the sense that uh, i think it's the fourth definition or the third definition that kidana will gives in his um, dictionary um which is that it's a it's a technical term for the piece of hymnography mm -hmm. um so you know uh you find um for example in uh byzantine byzantine um liturgy you know stikarion and you know uh they just take the, the greek words instead of you know stikarion means i don't know something to do with a rod instead yeah. of translating that that word as rod you know uh they choose to transliterate do. yeah this is this is yeah. the common um this is the this is why people have to study original languages this is the when my sister was uh a linguist very briefly in college she came up with this uh, italian phrase one time and she was telling me about it that they had this tradition where they said the translator is the traitor and i thought that was hilarious because i'm a, I'm a translator and interpreter and, and you are as well but there there's a sense in which people just need to pursue the original languages but the reality is they're not doing that and so that's why we have to translate it and and those decisions are 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 always difficult, and everyone is going to have uh, you know different points of view on when to do it, when not to do it. For example, it it is common to have most names in scripture transliterated in the way that you said, and sometimes when you have the double transliteration, that's how we get the name Jesus because it's originally Joshua, 
but it, it gets transliterated twice. And, and that's how we miss the connection between Jesus and Joshua uh, because of a double transliteration uh, that happens at one point. James yes. in the English tradition is supposed to be Jacob, but again, because of the nature of, of how people select what to translate and transliterate, the whole movements in the United States, like the Jehovah's Witness, you know, sometimes people will translate, I am that I am, in, in which case you don't need anything. Whereas some people have the reverence and they'll spell the consonants of the Lord's name without the vowels. And some people will add the vowels. Some people make it a Y. Some people make it a J. Some people make it a W, a V. Every jot and tittle uh, has a selection. But yes, I'm, I'm with you in the case that I think some things, uh, if you leave to transliteration, like I, I haven't pushed it logically, but I think, for example, maybe even the word exabhir. Uh, when transliterated from Gez to Amharic, they never translated it. They never said, which uh, people think is funny when I say it because it sounds ridiculous in Amharic. Even the they never said, nobody's ever said that. And I've said that to people to kind of to demonstrate to them that they know a little bit of Gez already in the sense that there are some things that that maintain that. So, so you're, you're saying that Melk is one of those things that maybe just leave it alone and people will understand that it's a genre of hymnography, uh, technically. Yeah. So, um, in the, uh, one of the more recent, um, uh, prints, or uh, publications of the, of the, the prayer book, I, I included a glossary because I was, uh, I realized mm -hmm. that, you know, um, there are a lot of youth using, um, uh, these books um, originally, you know, uh, didn't conceive of it as a, a youth prayer book, uh, <laughs> you know, so I use technical language like hypostatically, which even mm -hmm. some of the, the, the clergy, you know, might uh, <laughs> <laughs> wrestle with um, now and then. Um, but, um, you know, yeah, to explain certain words like, you know, what does abuna mean and, you know, what is tawado and, you know, all of these um, you know, words that, um, yeah, we transliterate. Uh, Melk, again, it's a, it's a technical term for a kind of hymn um, rather than, you know. That, that, that usually is um, venerating or if you want to use a different term, the, the various body parts of the, the, the image of the, right? Like, I think yeah. it, there is some root to it but like you said it, it it comes on to take on a new technical term um meaning yes yeah so it includes the um the subject as well so the, the it's yeah called milk for um a certain reason because it's talking about the um all the the images you know the the hair of the head and the eyebrows and and so on and so forth um so um yeah it, it speaks about the the image of the the person but you also have, um, you know, like Melka Korban, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the milk of the, the Eucharist, where, um, you know, that's uh, certainly, you know, not um, the same kind of uh, thing. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a name of a certain uh, genre of him, you know, um, as I've understood. But, but yeah, generally, um, you know, it's either the Godhead, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. Uh, Our Lady Mary, the angels, the righteous, you know, all the different categories of um, saint. And um, yeah, the, the hymn venerates the different um, body parts as well as certain um, elements from the, the saint's life. But I'm sure um, you'll have um, our brother, uh, Augustine. Augustine. Yes, I need to. We, we need our, our schedules to match and give him uh, some time to get acclimated to uh, his new home in, in Europe there. Um, I got to spend one day with you all in the reading group that he was organizing in studying various Malk. Um, I just wondered if you wanted to share, share some thoughts on on that experience as well and getting to read internationally with uh, people in, in this good is right tradition. Right, you know, that was a real blessing. As I've kind of um, always uh, envisaged, um, you know, working together with others, you know, so translations generally, they're not a one man job, you know, um, especially liturgical translations, you know, they're normally translated by committee um, or, you know, um, especially uh, nowadays in the modern era, you know, uh, yeah. 
in uh, you know in ancient times um, potentially more of uh, you know individual translation but um, you know uh, nowadays yeah it is, is viewed as something that you know you need to approach collectively more collectively so um, you know that was a real blessing to have the you know the reading group the milk um, reading group and um, yeah we we um, took on Melka uh, Arwai Tunsasa, so the uh, Melka of the, the Four Living Creatures. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that was a, such an interesting one to delve into and, you know, finding all of the uh, material from um, Enoch and, um, you know, uh, throughout scripture where it mentions the Kirubim um that yeah it was such a such a that's right that's that's a good point because that's one of the points i remember you and i discussing because it's uh it's harder for people at first to understand the the four living creatures sometimes they call them the four living beasts uh are from you know revelation but they also kind of mirror in ezekiel and as you said in in the um liturgical texts and extra um the awad and up to the extra books we we see them in in various corpuses within the church the thing about them is some some of the people like you said are interpreting them from the church point of view as other uh, cherubim or or kerubim like other other specific type of angels the ones usually depicted as the chubby cheeked babies in the in the western tradition uh, tradition and the heads with uh, wings attached to their head with big eyes and in the ethiopian uh, tradition of of artwork um whereas i think some people were just viewing them as uh, independent entities and so even myself i did i didn't have full clarity on uh, the interpretation tradition of them so that was that was a new experience for me in in learning and, and reading with you Okay. Well, yeah, that was, was a real blessing to have you with us. Um, you know, thankfully, yeah, we, we managed to uh, to complete it. We just need to review it before we can uh, hopefully um, have it printed. So that is that, that that is the plan. You know, to have these books there for uh, the faithful, for the laity, the clergy. Um, you know, all the members of the church to actually pray these texts. You know, and have communion with the saints, have communion with the angels. Um, so um, that that's really the uh, got to be the, the focus, and you know I really respect the academic, the more academic um, side of it as well. Um, so uh, yeah, I think we have to. Um, as I'm reminded of um, Pope John Paul's, you know, breathing with two lungs for some reason, but uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, have both the the academic side and the um, the uh side of devotion piety yeah. so you, uh, you mean in terms of like parsing manuscripts and and seeing you know what is the the true text uh quote unquote the, yeah. you know, it, it, by by comparing the oldest uh available manuscripts exactly yeah, yeah yeah that's right you hit the nail on the head there it's um you know yes uh invaluable work that um you know people like augustine are doing there to really go through all the manuscripts and you know find the the earliest witnesses right through to you know um books that are printed in the 21st century that have you know completely different traditions you know that have uh, continued probably in the in the oral tradition and so on and so forth and you know, and and all of that so um you know um yeah it's, it's it's a real joy you know to be able to to do that work now and you know we have so many um, resources now um even you know when i started um as i say around 10 years ago when i went to seminary around 11 years ago now um yeah there was a lot less you know and now it's, mm -hmm. it's really starting to sort of um yeah increase so uh, yeah you know, we, we had one you... book from uh, uh his eminence who passed away i i also sometimes say his beatitude uh abu namalkas edik who passed away earlier this year he fell asleep with the lord a um, long time long time uh, giant in our church he had the this his book the teaching on the ethiopian orthodox church and i think that was like the sole english book that we had <laughs> available at at our parish and so i've done a number of ad hoc uh, translations of for example zotaris alot i think we had the budge copy of wudasi mariam so we've we've spread we've spread kind of the daily prayers and the praise of mary in that way but to sort of like systematically go through everything and provide texts that could be used uh, for catechesis. I mean, we we don't 
<laughs> we did not really have that, but these things are they're new and and they're burgeoning. So I I am I am hopeful and like you said, using uh, both lungs to breathe is uh, is very powerful, especially because in in Semitic languages and other ancient languages, the the breath is is tied to the soul and and the spirit. I always t tell people how the same siruak al in in is you have uh, stinfas, nafas, and manfas. Um, all all together and so there is there is some connection between all of those things there in 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 what animates us and and what moves us and and during uh, this new plague of ours you've had an opportunity to work on a, another publication is that right about the miracles of Mary yes um so the uh, yeah the miracles of uh, our lady Mary Tamar Mariam and uh, also Tamar Jesus, uh, Miracles of Our Lord. Um, uh, Tamar Jesus is um, actually something that I began uh, as when I returned uh, from 2014 and gradually started to um, complete it now. Um, I'd say about three quarters of the way through the whole thing. But the, uh, the project that I'm, I've been working on is to Unite the miracles with the, the lectionary, Matafa Gatawi, a project uh, that I've been working on. Is you know, to have, to first to have a, a printed lectionary. You know, um, you might see lots of tell us about that. Some people uh, don't know. Uh, you know. Some people don't know the lectionary is the schedule of readings. Can you say a little bit about that? I've used that word around people before, and they looked at me funny. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, yeah, the the two main parts of the lectionary are uh, the sanctoral and uh, the temporal. Um, and the temporal is uh, the part of the lectionary that I've done most. So that's the readings uh, from New Testament plus the um, Psalm versicle or Musbak, uh, which is um, chanted by the by the and um, by the, the whole uh, congregation uh, during the Divine Liturgy, Kadasi. Um, so uh, it includes the, the readings from the New Testament and the, the Psalm, which is chanted. Um, and also you'll find the, the Mesmor uh, from the Dugwa, so the hymnary of uh, St. Yarid. Um, so uh, it's uh, focuses, the temporal part focuses on in themes uh, mostly for uh, the that uh, the liturgical season uh, that we find ourselves in a given time in the liturgical year. Um, so, you know, we're on the season direction coming toward, you know, the, the end of the, the season of resurrection and um, we'll, we'll um, proceed to Astemaro, uh, which are the uh, season of imploration for mercy, um, and then uh, Kremt, which is the, the rainy season and so on. So, um, yeah, the, the various uh, seasons of the year have different themes and, um, you know, I've uh, kind of undertaken this uh, original work, um, which no one no one's done before, um, of uniting the uh, the reading, the, the passages, uh, chapters and so on from Tamara Mariam and Tamar Jesus uh, with the, the theme for the day. Sometimes days that um, uh, take place within the, the liturgical year, the season, um, and the, the, um, and what I've uh, tried to do is uh, include all the, the the miracles, so we don't have to sort of flick around. Often you see um, clergy kind of just picking up the book and sort of dipping straight into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I so, um, I have noticed that. Um, I I've always found it curious. You've raised a, a brilliant point in talking about the originality of what you're trying to do. Is that I've noticed that there's this tradition of reading from the miracles of Mary and the miracles of Jesus. There's also um, various gadlat or other dursanat that um, depending on the parish, I, I've seen different parishes have different rules, sometimes based off of the name of the parish, but sometimes uh, not even based off the name of the parish. It might be, you know, the personal piety of that priest. You know, I, it, it, it really, it doesn't seem to 
Uh, and why I say that is it's not written in the lectionary. You don't you don't see it written in the lectionary. It doesn't tell you what to read, whereas everything else is almost in excruciating detail. If you want to, you know, express individuality, it is it is crushing your individuality and showing you the church has has her voice and it tells you every single thing what you're supposed to read, and and yet, like you're saying, uh, with the tradition of some of these other books, it it doesn't tell you what to read at all. So uh, that that is definitely another another gap that you are able to uh, locate in in the tradition as you're. Um, widening the uh, range of texts available in the, in the English language. Okay, so the, um, the lectionary that we have within our church, um, it, 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 there's not just one lectionary, we should say, to begin with. There are various um, traditions, um, and when we look back at the um, manuscript evidence, we have uh, manuscripts dating back to the, the 14th century, 14th or 15th century, um, however, there was one complete lectionary um, until the 20th century. That's, yeah, uh, that's right. The bait and the, the touch bait, the upper houses and the, the lower houses um, and, until they were consolidated and and finalized and, and got this, the kind of final stamp of, of approval in the church. I mean, that... That, that goes to a, a larger point of, uh, you know, people have asked me, how do saints get canonized in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church? You know, and it, it seems the, the Roman Catholics, for example, have a very sort of structured, organized way, whereas ours, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem to be uh, very top down. It's more bottom up in terms of someone becomes a, a local hero and, um, you know, more and more people hear about them and and it seems like the the lectionary is is similar in that regard like it wasn't uh some king or some patriarch who uh you know it wasn't a patriarch of of alexandria who said this is the lectionary or it wasn't any of the kings as far as i know but um kind of local traditions gathering until they consolidate is that is that fair from your understanding as well yeah yeah that's fair just because there was some um outside noise outside that i didn't want to uh, include in the video but i think you know, you know you're quite right there um you know uh, there are various uh, uh traditions of uh interpretation you know the common traditions so the um chan school yeah um and so on so they all uh contribute uh in their own way you know to producing um a final uh a completed work such so as a lectionary um so you you know you read about uh in some of the um research that's been done on the lectionary you know um scholars just saying you know read this today read that you know it's, it's basically um done from from memory but then yeah it's only in the 20th century that you find uh a book a completed book called metafa gatawi with you know all the um the commemorations for the whole year, the you know, 365, 366 days, the, the sanctuary, that's the, the calendar of saints, saints days throughout the year, and also the, the temporal, um, which is, as I said, the, um, the part which I've focused on mostly for the, um, the Sunday readings, Sunday lessons. So, um, um, yeah, that you only find that in the 20th century. So my own work is not completely a, a work of complete innovation, it's based within the tradition, um, and I've looked at various ways um, that the mirror was chosen before. So, looking at some of the maps um, um, that have rubrics in them and um, state that you know a certain miracle should be read at a certain time, um, and ask the question, you know, why uh, that has been chosen. Um, you know, the, the yeah, the the miracles themselves, the you know manuscripts. Of and Tamari, yes, uh, but also books like Metafa uh, Gibraha Mamat, which includes you know, the readings of the miracles for various hours and, you know, uh, looking at why uh, certain miracles have been selected and uh, the uh, kind of approach that the, the scholars have taken to, you know, compiling that kind of work and really taking that uh, thought of the fathers and, and running with it to, to produce something that, you know, we don't have to 
just flick around in a book for you know 30 seconds before we approach you know <laughs> <laughs> and just in case anyone thought that your uh, ability to not feel fatigue was over uh, we have more and that is that you're also examining the sa'atat or the liturgy of the hours which is something that i have been uh, looking at myself and and looking at a, a, a few different manuscripts but also looking at some of the new uh, materials that they've been printing again it's one of those things that i see uh, discrepancies even in the in the modern the modern church is not consolidated on that i've seen at least two different uh, variants. I think there's a, a Shoah variant and a Dabrabai. Uh, Dabrabai is, of course, in Tigray on the border with uh, Gwander, um there on the Tekaze River. So I, I've seen uh, two variants at least. I, I, I don't know um, uh, which which one is it. Uh, did you just take a modern translation or are you looking at the manuscripts for the Sa'atat as well? Okay, so yeah, no, with the uh, Sa'atat, we um, started with a kind of um, hodgepodge mixture of the two, which is, uh, uh, I think, unfortunate. Um, so over the years, I've tried to um, purify um, the tradition so that we're just working with, with one tradition, either, you know, it's got to be the Selikula or mm -hmm. uh, Deborah Bai. And uh, um, as the um, Current uh, Archdeacon Likriakon Amdatzion is serving at Zion. Um Now he he went to Ethiopia and studied at um, uh, Zuwai, uh, the monastery, um, and you know he learned uh, Deborah uh, Zema there in the Kadasi uh, bit uh, training that he received. So um, yeah, we've uh, we gradually started to move more towards uh, Deborah Bai and you know uh, there's a very good um, uh, edition of the Deborah Bai um, Sa'atat Abba, Abba um, I forget his um, uh, surname but uh, yeah uh, Abba uh former um, Lika Sultanat now Lika Lika Awan, um, serving at um, Boli Mithani Alim Salim Madhani Alim. And so, yeah, his uh, book is basically what we've been working with, uh, not looking at um, manuscripts and so on. And just the um, parts that uh, I've called Matins and Vespers. Right. Yeah, so, about the, how do you, the, the, yeah, the, how do you, can you, tell, can you tell us about that in identifying? Because I've had, again, friends of the Greek tradition trying to compare and say, for example, like, one of the issues I've come into of defining or matching what is matins or what is vespers is that, uh, as far as I know, the antiphonary, the the dugwa, and the saatat almost have the same role in being prayers for all times of the day. And I've heard of some larger cathedrals. Well, there, well, there, uh, you know, on the one side they pray the dugwa, and the other side they pray the saatat, so that. The kind of all the prayers are happening uh, simultaneously, so it, it was. It's been hard for me to to answer that question. Um, how how is it that you that which part are you referring to as as the matins and which the vespers? Right. Yes. Um, I think it's the more conditions um, so on requires uh, a lot more uh, clergy or you know. Um, manpower in terms of uh, canter so um, you know it's more common just to have um, the, the uh, matins from you know the, the raising of incense in the thing um, uh, in the, the chants with um, um, uh, our readings of the the miracles as we mentioned um, you know lit on uh, and so on uh, so um, yeah, it's that that that's the um, service I'm calling I matins, see. as it's the more common tradition. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and then vespers again, um, uh, mostly known for Maharan Ab, um, and but there are other you know uh, litanies and um, uh, responses and so on that, that are included in that, uh, in addition to the reading of the Holy Gospel. 
and some vertical, uh, as we mentioned earlier. So um, those are the two services that I'm focusing on, and yeah, specifically uh, the Debra Bai uh, tradition. Yes, and that's the this I have the same from the same father the lectionary that we use both at my parish and then me personally at home. It's the same exact print book that that I have. Um, so I, I it must be other parishes that perhaps are using a sedet kulla or or maybe even something else that <laughs> that I don't know about. So that that's wonderful. And you you mentioned our our brother uh, the Archdeacon Amdes Ion. Perhaps we'll have to uh, invite him on the program too. I'm familiar with him. I know he's a recently married as well. Looks like uh, as well as me have been in enjoying those those photos. And Sirha um, Ion, uh, we've mentioned a few times uh, your uh, parish. Can you tell us where people can tune in to the past recordings and to future recordings so that they can find all of these English language ministries that we've been referencing? Yes. So um, <clears throat> the Zarahatzion um, YouTube channel um, is, uh, you'll find that Zarahatzion, um, uh, which is spelled uh, T S E R H A Zion, T S I O N, um, St. Mary of Zion. So Zarahatzion, St. Mary of Zion is the name of the YouTube channel. And the um, the Facebook page, um, it's Saint Mary of Zion, uh, UK, uh, all one word. So um, once again, yeah, Mary uh, Zion. Sorry, uh, again the same spelling. Zaha, um, with the uh, I O N. Uh, to the word Zion. So St. Mary Zion UK is the Facebook page and um, St. Mary of Zion is the YouTube page. So but, um, um, you can find the, the past recordings there and um, yeah, um, regular regular services there on um saturdays you know we're renting we're looking forward to having our own building in the future um so um you know uh, that's that's what we really design of the building is uh, based on axum Eon. you know it's a renovate or converting a cinema into a church <laughs> the architectural design of Axum Zeos uh, commissioned by His Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie. So um, that's um, that's what we're working towards. Um, and um, uh, you can find uh, all of the recordings on those uh, pages there, the YouTube and the, the Facebook pages. Thank you so much. But I'm an Amasagganalan, Xiavihir, Yehuvak. Uh, oh, I mean, I mean, uh, we, uh, I mean, I mean, 